Welcome to the State of the Nation. I'm your host, Michael Sham, and with me today is another Michael, Michael Beaumont, Chairman of Action SA. Michael, welcome back to the State of the Nation. As you can see, you're in fancy new studio here in Parkhurst. When last we spoke, we were in a little boardroom in Bryanston, but here we are, sitting in the dark in Parkhurst. Yeah, now there's been a lot of that lately, actually. I yeah. live just down the road, in fact, so I've been sitting in the dark with you for yeah. the last few hours. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and, and in many ways, it's, it's typical of, of what happens. On the one hand, you've got power that goes out. That's bad, bad enough, it should, one should say. But on top of it, you, you have uh, the infrastructure that collapses, so now they can't get the power back up in this particular block. The fiber has gone down. The Wi-Fi has gone down. And uh, we are sitting here, you know, sort of like, um, you know, really, you know, sort of like this is not a modern country. What's your take on, on the situation, Michael? I mean, this is killing business. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it's just one wave of assault after assault on businesses and the economy. So, I mean, load shedding is not a recent development, but certainly this continuous load shedding and the severe stages of load shedding has been a, a development of the last six months or so. Uh, we've seen the story about the grey listing of South Africa recently. It's just one thing after the next, the collapsing infrastructure, etc. And I think there are so many businesses in South Africa that are in distress right now. We know the unemployment rate is through the roof. And the country has got to be looking for a political solution and some direction that's going to point us in the way of economic growth. Because the one thing you can't deny about the South African economy is it's resilient having put up with all of these challenges. What it just needs is a government that enables it rather than disabling it. You know, um, it feels a little bit different this time. I don't know if it's just me, but it feels like people across the board, you know, in, in past where, we, where we've had these pockets of complaint, it felt like a section of the, mm. of the South African population would be unhappy, be it your business sector that was unhappy, um, you know, if you go back to the Zuma years, but then you sort of separately to that of a, a local government issue, you'd have uh, demonstrations, which is a kind word of saying kind of riots in townships. Now there seems to be a universal unhappiness. This must be uh, making uh, life of a political party, opposition political party, a lot easier to recruit. Is that the case? Look, certainly. I mean, the environment for us couldn't be better from a point of view of recruiting people. And I think I say that guardedly because, of course, the things that make the environment right for an opposition party are so often the things that are bad for the country itself. So it's always a bit of a double-edged sword that way. But certainly what we are finding is that across the board, it's not a, it's not a class thing, it's not a race thing, it's not a gender thing. Across the board, South Africans are absolutely hurtful about the situation. We've seen in the latest market research that as much as 85% of South Africans are saying the country's moving in the wrong direction. And remarkably, even 65% of ANC supporters are saying it's moving in the wrong direction. And how this is manifesting from our point of view as a political party is we, we can't, frankly, reach enough people on a daily basis who are availing themselves to Action SA across the country because people are frustrated with the ANC without any question. But they're also frustrated with the political establishment. I mean, the... Political parties in the so-called opposition and parliament have been there for so many years and yet still seem completely incapable of providing any kind of viable alternative to the ANC. Voters don't see them as an alternative, and so many people are now looking elsewhere for political solutions. And from our point of view, we're experiencing that on the ground. To be fair to the, to the, the, the parties in opposition... You know, um, you could look at, uh, at the Eskom debacle, uh, you know, and, and we are seeing it in, in two ways. You know, you've got a sector of the population, um, you know, largely represented by, let's say, traditionally the DA and, and, and those kind of parties that say, look, maybe the, the solution could lie in greater privatization. But then you've got many other supporters, ANC and EFF supporters, that would say, look, the problem is too much privatization, the government should really take over everything because the problem is that they don't sort of run enough of it. Uh, you know, it's quite difficult for those opposition parties because they're not sort of uni united in their uh, sort of like um, attack on the government for their poor performance because they're looking at it from two totally different angles. I'm much less generous than you are on this one, actually, Mike, because I, I look at the situation right now 
of the same environment you were referring to. And let's be honest, in South Africa, you know, you've got 43% unemployment, you've got 85 people being murdered a day, you've got between 8 and 11 hours of load shedding taking place every day. And if political parties cannot win people over by convincing them of the strength of their policies and positions and solutions for the country in that environment, then I am much more critical of the opposition space precisely because of that. Having said that, I mean, we've even had a situation, and I do understand, we, we, we sort of, this, this is not, um, uh, you know, I don't want to sort of dwell too long on this. We've had a situation for the last decade where one province is being run like it's a different planet compared to the other eight, right? There's, there's no comparison that the Western Cape is, is a success story when compared to the other eight. But that hasn't been enough to influence voters. So what more can the opposition parties do, in your opinion, that they're not doing? Well, I mean, let's just go back a step, because I always like to challenge this notion about the Western Cape. And to say that the Western Cape has run better than ANC provinces is kind of, you know, setting the bar very, very low, because we know ANC governance is at the level of the floor, and quite frankly, you can crawl over it. Mm. But the notion that the experience for all people in the Western Cape is better in the Western Cape versus outside of the Western Cape is fundamentally not true. If it were the case that the DA government in the Western Cape and Cape Town delivered successfully to those communities, the DA would be getting more than the 3 to 5% that they're getting in those communities right now. If Kayalisha and Langa and Guguletu and places like that were doing a lot better than they are, they would be held up as success stories around the country. And I'm afraid if you look at the model of successful governance in the Western Cape, it is skewed in terms of where that service delivery is taking place. But I think to answer the point, you know, Political parties need to demonstrate an ability to grow. I think that's a critical question. If, if we see the ANC falling below 50%, which we are, and far below 50%, it's got to be about growth. Opposition parties have to demonstrate that they are gaining votes from the other side of the aisle so that they can contribute to what we know is going to be a coalition alternative in 2024. But there's also got to be tangible solutions. We've got to have a situation where political parties are putting down more than the endless commentary and analysis like they were political commentators but actually saying these are the things that we would do to solve these problems and lay it down in such a way that south africans could believe in that yeah just to just to go back a step I, i'm i'm always sort of fascinated by the the argument of saying you know the, the kaya Lecha argument i mean i must admit you know to, to doing quite a bit of eye roll when it comes to that because on on two scores if one looks at, at the western cape number one is is that if you go back to 2004 the DA didn't even have a majority in the Western Cape, and now it nearly has a two-thirds majority. So clearly people have spoken with their votes. If the, if the conditions were so bad in, in those areas that you outlined, then you wouldn't have a constant stream of people you know, leaving other provinces. I'm not talking about rich people flying down to Cape Town. I'm talking about poor people getting on a tortuous bus journey from the Eastern Cape to move to the Western Cape. Sure. So, you know, I don't know, you know, as, as it's, depending on where you stand, it's a convenient argument to say, oh, well, you know, it's not so great. Go to Kaya Lecha. Well, Kaya Lecha is never going to disappear, okay, even if you had the world's most supreme government, because we do have a, very, uh, a big supply of people that are prepared to live in a dip slurt or a Kaya Lecha. They are not necessarily incentivized to, you know, grow gardens and, uh, and um, you know, make the place look like a, like a suburb rather than a township. So do you not think that uh, there's got to be a statute of limitations on that argument? No, I don't, actually. I mean, I think the fact that people come from the Eastern Cape, which is economically the most hard-hit province in the country, and move to the Western Cape, which economically is doing better than other provinces, and let's be clear, we're not suggesting that the DA does everything bad. Mm. We're not suggesting that there aren't success stories of their time in government in the Western Cape. What I'm suggesting to you is that the idea that is a universal experience mm. across the Western Cape isn't quite true. And again, I think many of those people who you would find moving for economic opportunities in the Western Cape aren't finding those economic opportunities or the improvement in infrastructure and all of those features taking place around Kailicha, Langa, Guguletu, yeah. and the Cape Flats. They're finding it elsewhere. And I think it's just important to challenge that narrative because, once again, if the Democratic Alliance were governing so successfully in those communities, 
they would be doing a hell of a lot better than the 5% they're getting in the vote in those communities. I think that's the point we're yeah. going to make. Uh, you, you see, uh, the reason that I'm, I'm hammering on in this is, is, is purely because it seems to me that uh, once again, you know, no progress gets made because we're kind of having a debate about this, but yet you can have the Premier of the North West saying there are no potholes in the North West, sure. which, is, you know, which is a joke. So we're kind of sort of uh, um, debating whether the DA does a 6 out of 10 job or an 8 out of 10 job given what they've got in, in the Western Cape, whereas the ANC are doing a, a 0 out of 10 job in the others. Now surely that is where the argument must, must, uh, must, you know, must lie. Um, especially with the, the looming election coming up and we're going to need all the friends we can get. Well, I think the argument's got to be that South Africa deserves a better than a 0 out of 10 government. Correct. Let's agree with that. I mean, that's just straight 100%. up. 100%. But I also think they deserve a better than 6 out of 10 government. Mm. And I think with coalitions being the future in South Africa, and I mean, don't get me wrong, they've, they've manifested in various troubling ways. But whether we like it or not, we know it's the future. The reality is a grouping of political parties, including the Democratic Alliance for what it is worth, that is able to lift the bar in service delivery and perhaps take away some of those blind spots in service delivery that are apparent in the Western Cape. Yeah, yeah. you see, I, I think for, for, for real progress to, to be made in this country, surely we must measure progress. You know, and uh, that's why I'm, I'm always sort of fascinated by this reversion back to an argument to, to, to this debate. So, so, so let's move it forward. Here we sit in supposed to be, or what used to be, the economic hub of, of South Africa, unable to get through a traffic light because it ain't working. Uh, you know, no uh, infrastructure because it's collapsing because of maladministration um, and, and, and so on. And you think to yourself, okay, we've got an election a year from now. Right? Do you think that the voter is now angry enough to vote against their sentimental political home of the ANC? I think there's two, there's two dynamics that arise by virtue of that anger, because I think the first point is the anger is, is indisputable. Mm. I think it's universal, it's across the board, it crosses all demographic lines in South Africa, and everyone's angry. And I think it's going to manifest in two ways. So firstly, I do think that there are some political parties that are making major inroads at the expense of the ANC. I regard Action SA to be one of them, and I regard the IFP to be another. And I say that because it's just so important to people understand the only way that an alternative coalition can come in is if those votes are taken from the ANC. Rearranging the opposition space, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, it gives you something to do, but it's not really taking you anywhere. Yeah. But I think the second manifestation that we've seen a lot lately is a lot of ANC supporters who stay away by just not coming out to vote, and that's their protest against ANC failure. Uh, we saw it in 2021, uh, we saw it in 2019, and we saw it in 20, uh, 2016. Uh, and I think between those two dynamics, it has the impact that we've seen the ANC fall below 50% of the first time in South Africa a year or so ago. And now you've got an additional dynamic where you start to see polling, where the ANC is now falling below 40% even for the first time. And I think really those two dynamics of how people express their anger are going to have a huge impact in 2024. The one thing that I think is missing right now, and is something that we want to work very hard towards resolving, is giving people a thing to vote against is one element. And don't get me wrong, it's always going to be a factor when you have an ANC government in South Africa. But what are we asking people to vote for? And I think that's been a missing dimension in the opposition space. We've seen it in prior elections that when people believe that this election is going to remove a government and replace it, turnout is through the roof. At least turnout of people who want that change. And I think that is where political parties need to collaborate and present themselves in such a manner that they can inspire that confidence in next year's election. You know, if, if, if one looks at that, it's, it's kind of difficult and, and, and you must, you, you're going to encounter the same difficulty because uh, once again, you know, this being South Africa, I'm always fascinated by this idea that the opposition party should give the people something to vote for. Well, what can you do other than give them words? Because you're, you kind of can't do anything else but say, when we come into power, we'll do X, Y, Z. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen. So in other words, you could put all campaigning into that category and saying, well, you know, 
You've got to give them something to vote for. Well, what else can we do other than saying we're going to govern better than them? Sure. Well, look, I think the point is that, I mean, a lot of campaigning will ultimately come down to words. Mm. Uh, I guess the question is how credible those words are. And voters have a couple of different things to use when they measure the credibility of those words in an election campaign. Because let's be honest, election campaigns are filled with promises and yeah, spectacular sure. commitments and uh, all sorts of bizarre forms of behavior. And I think really there's a few things. One has got to be political parties' track records in government and how they have participated in coalitions for a standing point. Um, and particularly because if you accept the notion that coalitions are the future of South Africa, which I think has got to be universally true, the question becomes how political parties behave in coalition becomes you know, a very big part of how a voter thinks going forward. But beyond that, there's also got to be consideration for how credible those parties are and how trustworthy they are. And I think the fortunate thing for when you consider 2024 is that comparison will take place between a group of parties and the ANC. And I think there couldn't be a party with any less credibility for words used yeah. in an election campaign than the ANC. Yeah, and and one would imagine that, uh, you know, the, the ANC, good Lord, if, 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 they, if people will still vote for them after their performance now, right? Where you know the the manifestation of all of their their hard work in destroying the country seems to have come together at this one wonderful sort of moment where we've got no power, we've been grey listed, we've been you know the economy is down the toilet and unemployment is rife. You've got to say if voters still find that compelling. There is really not a lot that Action SA or any of the other political parties can do. One would imagine. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I see it slightly differently in as much as I see the inability to shift ANC voters across in a time of this kind of crisis to be a negative reflection on opposition political parties. Uh, and certainly I think we're seeing a lot of people coming across in that way. And certainly we're seeing a lot of ANC politicians, ironically, who are now starting to talk to political parties on the other side, knowing that their tenure of security is gone mm. after 2024. It appears to be common knowledge in the ANC that government and, and the ANC as they knew it is completely over. And I think from that point of view, you know, there certainly is this dynamic where what was once an indestructible majority, I mean, we're seeing it now even, this local government coalition set up in places like Etiquene and places where coalitions were, were never going to take yeah, place. Sure. So there's a vulnerability that's never been seen before. Now, Michael, it's a it's a very interesting uh, thing that you've uh, spoken about, which, of course, um, we've always, in in many circles, not often spoken about, about the ANC politicians sort of saying, how long are you guys going to stay on this oh. Titanic deck while we, we sort of charge towards that our, uh, iceberg over there? Um, do you foresee any kind of split, or do you just see a... A dissolution after the election of the ANC. What do you think happens there? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's talk about a split. I'm, I'm personally less compelled uh, by the idea that there will be a split in the ANC. But I guess at the same time, I'm also less motivated by the idea that that split would represent something. Hmm. Uh, most fundamentally, because there is this notion that appears to be taking hold uh, among some, including the official opposition, that there is a good ANC and a bad ANC which is actually quite amusing because they were the ones who said there's, there's, there's neither, it's just the ANC. Mm. Uh, and the notion that a split would lend itself towards a grouping of people we can work with and a grouping of people we can't work with is quite problematic for me when you regard the fact that President Ramaphosa came in on a reform agenda. He was going to fix the country and fix the ANC. And if he and the individuals that form part of his grouping represent the good ANC, there is no evidence to suggest that they can be worked with to fight corruption, mm. to defeat load shedding, to tackle the problems we have with crime, or to provide any economic direction to our country. So I think from that point of view, whether there will be a split or whether it'll be, I, I don't regard it to be something that'll be monumental to yeah. the direction of us, our, our political system. Yeah, I mean, look, and, and they're a big organization, they're a big movement. You know, um, and I've definitely uh, fully buy into the, 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 the sort of argument that says there is no good ANC. Oh. And I get that, but that is a little bit like saying because the Lions are coming forth in, out of the South African sides playing over there that all the players are bad. Oh. 
maybe if you put them in different uh, oh, teams, sure. they might they might be good because. You know, interestingly, I remember one of my early discussions with uh, with Herman Mashaba, your um, um, leader, um, and you know, when we were talking about at that point, he was he was getting a lot of people joining Action SA from other parties, and you know, we sort of I said to him, uh, you know, are you going to keep on recruiting from the DA primarily and and those kind of parties? He said, well. Who could I take from the ANC, which I think is a, is a wonderful way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, is there anybody in the ANC that you could identify in, you know, in their senior reaches that you would want to uh, have on your books? You know, I think certainly you, you've got to accept that there are good people broadly in the ANC. Now, I mean, please understand that means people who are leaders in communities, mm. people who may be in government, uh, etc., um, as to the specifics of who they are, I mean, yeah. I, I wouldn't get into specifically. But what I would suggest is that there, there are good people. But I do know in the past when we've been approached by people in the ANC, we've really had two key considerations. The first is obviously is what is the track record of this particular person, mm. which I think is, you know, the thing that everyone focuses on. Is there any controversy around them, etc.? But the broader question sometimes has to be raised. What have they done mm. in the face of endemic corruption, failure, load shedding, etc. And if the answer is that they sat by and continue to participate in that political establishment, that doesn't lend itself towards the idea that that person is a credible person. Because mm. what you see a lot in the ANC these days is this notion of ANC unity must come first. The president yeah. himself keeps talking about yeah. it. And you get the sense that if he had the option of unifying the ANC or ending load shedding, he, he would choose unification of the ANC any day. Well, he, he, he said it at the start of his presidency. He said that he would rather be known as a bad president than be known as the president to uh, split the ANC. Ironically, he's going to be known as both. I was about to say, yeah, he seems to have accomplished both. So clearly, clearly multitasking in the course of the last few years. Yeah, which is quite strange. I mean, you know, let's, let's talk for a second about, uh, about President Ramaphosa because... You know, and there was a lot of uh, promise and there were a lot of people rushing around and I never failed to mention Peter Bruce, you know, in his big campaign of, uh, you know, we've got to support uh, Cyril Ramaphosa when he became president because he's the guy who can fix the country. Um, I did uh, try desperately to, to not get people to listen to that nonsense, but sadly, many people that I know did. Sure. Um, now, you know, he, he is quite an enigmatic guy, uh, quite clearly doesn't really like doing the work by the, by the looks of it. Likes making laws, but doesn't like being in charge by the looks of things. Is that about right? Yeah, I, I, get, I get a sense that there's just a level of indecision and indecisiveness. I mean, when you have great challenges that face a country and, and great dilemmas of a kind of service delivery or moral nature, it always appears that the default position for the president is to announce a process rather than you know something deliberate and decisive. So there'll be a commission of inquiry or a investigation of some kind etc but when it comes actually to you know fly your flag up the mast of a very particular course of action uh, there's always this complete paralysis around the fear of uh, offending someone in the ecosystem of the ANC that is going to cause internal dis disunity within the ANC and that's why you have this dynamic where the president can stand up and talk one thing about the economy in front of a business audience and then can stand up and say the bipolar opposite in front of a trade union. Uh, and I think that is really the worst kind of thing we can have right now because, you know, going back to your remark about he, he'd rather be a bad president than break up the ANC, I think the worst thing you can have in South Africa's current situation is the indecisive president. I think at a certain point in time, making no decision at all becomes worse than even a bad decision. Mm. And I think that's a lot, large part of what's characterized his presidency. Yeah, it, it, it just seems quite bizarre as a, as a sort of a South African citizen and, and somebody that, that sort of follows us quite closely. You know, he, he, he talks, we've known since the end of last year where he apparently got this wonderful mandate which allowed him within his party to act because now suddenly he was the big boss and basically his slate prevailed. And uh, yet we've seen no cabinet reshuffle. We... He announces a, a minister for electricity, and yet no minister is forthcoming. It, it's almost like he's quit. You know? it's, it's hard to see uh, where, where he stands. Well, let's be honest a second, if you'll forgive me for interrupting. Mm. 
he, he actually tried to quit. He did. So you had that dynamic around Palapala Pala where resignation was drafted and yeah. it was there, and he was held on to with the idea that he had to stay on for the sake of the ANC. Yeah. So I think if you're asking questions about his how compelled he is to continue in the job and fix the country, I think there's big questions that have got to be asked. Yeah, well, you know, um, he, he is without question a very yeah. reluctant president, but that doesn't help us much because no. the country is, is gradually... Yeah, it's one thing to to get into the news for the wrong reasons. It's even worse when people. What do they say when you you know it's it's bad publicity is bad publicity when people stop talking about you at all. Mm. You know, and at the moment South Africa seems to only make the headlines. The only thing that South Africa is in the headlines for at the moment is our continued support for Russia's invasion of uh, the Ukraine. That seems to be uh, the one area that uh, does attract international attention. As a party, where do you stand on, on the ANC's support of Russia? Well, I think it's, it's completely inexcusable. I think there has to be a baseline understanding in our international relations framework that the sovereign territory of a country has got to be defended by the rest of the world. Uh, because the minute we start having any kind of defense of aggression and uh, breaches of territorialism is, is how you end up with uh, the world wars that we've had in the, in, in the history of, of, of the world. And, you know, you, you cannot have a situation where particularly our country's foreign policy is based on Cold War politics. I mean, let's call it like it is. The affinity towards Russia and even more bizarrely Cuba comes out of the relationships in the 1950s and 60s, which, you know, well and good, the West was not a friend of the fight against apartheid in those eras. There's no question about that. But to then say that in 2023, our foreign policy should not be dictated about where the most economic value is for our country or human rights or any of these other really important considerations, but rather based on the politics of 70 years ago, is just completely outrageous. I mean, we have the most bizarre programs with a country like Cuba, which, I mean, I think if we're honest, offers us zero mm -hmm. from a strategic point of view. But here we have a program where South African doctors are sent to Cuba to go and study medicine when we have world-class institutions here at home. Yeah. Or even worse, we take engineers from Cuba to come and work in South Africa. And it just makes absolutely no sense for the country. Yeah, and we're going to pay a price for this. Um, yeah, I think, I think especially this, this, this love affair that they've got with Russia, there's a price that's going to be paid if the ANC remain in power after 2024 because there's going to be, there's going to be um, a look at allies after the war, one way or the other. And now, should Russia prevail, you know, I think what a lot of people aren't getting is, should they prevail in Ukraine? Uh, it's hard, which they've struggled with uh, thus far. It's very hard to see them invading anywhere else in Europe, so it's going to stop there. And then people are going to go and say, well, who supported you? And, uh, and isolate them. And I would say that unless we get a new government singing a different tune, this could come back to bite us quite badly. Without any question, and we've seen the resolution on the floor of the United States Congress going through their committee system. And the minute you have a country like the U.S., which is you know, our biggest trade partner from a, a surplus point yeah. of view, uh, reviewing their relationship with South Africa, I mean, the economic impact of that is going to be staggering. I mean, the preferential trade mm -hmm. agreements we have under GOA and et cetera, yeah. when you start foregoing that, and it's always important to remember, Mike, is that uh, the U.S. doesn't act in isolation. They form part of a grouping of parties through... You know, the G7, G8, and, and they are going to seriously start seeing other, other countries, I suspect, reviewing their relationships with South Africa. And collectively, the trade represented in that grouping of, of, of countries towards South Africa is absolutely massive. But we are seeing it at an interesting level ourselves because we are seeing a lot of, of governments starting to engage political parties in the opposition space who have been vocal against these kind of issues. And they are taking a very direct interest in these issues because the, the, the tremendous disappointment they have with the South African government stance. Yeah. So, Mike, we've, we've sketched a picture of, of a government com seemingly completely out of touch with the South African situation. Uh, a reluctant president who's in hiding. Um, you know, bad policies that have led us to, uh, um, you know, 12 hours of blackouts in a day. Um, an economy down the toilet and unemployment through the roof. Uh, Action SA comes on board. Um, a good story to tell Herman's, uh, Herman Mashaba, enigmatic guy, 
bit of a track record, you know, about the only person in politics in South Africa who can talk having achieved something outside of politics, right? Um, is it now just a matter of Action SA hitting the road, recruiting voters, recruiting yeah. members, um, putting up structures? How is that going? Look, I mean, it's going exceedingly well. Uh, I think very importantly for us is we deliberately limited contestation to six municipalities in 2021. And I think that was the right call at the time not to spread ourselves too thinly. But of course, now is the project of getting established in all nine provinces in the relatively short gap between there and the 2024 elections. That work is going very well. We are led in nine provinces now uh, by high profile South Africans, all of whom have a very Im big impact in their respective provinces. Uh, and yes, I mean, there's no question. It's not a silver bullet approach. You can't, you know, pull a magic trick and suddenly you're a big party. Mm -hmm. But what we are seeing is that there's very steady progress that is going to put us in a position where we could realistically become the second biggest party in South Africa in 2024. And uh, that growth, will that come totally at the expense of some of your coalition parties? Or, you know, if you had to sort of give me a yardstick, that, that kind of growth, let's say you were to hit your targets, right? Uh, how many of those voters would be voters that are, are not necessarily moving from any of the opposition parties, but are moving either from, you know, they disaffected ANC voters or they are previously unvoted people? Sure. So, I mean, certainly, I think, to be clear, in 2021, half of our vote came from previous ANC communities. Uh, and I say that because the idea of, you know, ANC communities in 2023 is thankfully no longer a thing. But, I mean, for example, Action SA got 22% of the vote across the whole of Soweto. Uh, and that's a demonstration that this is an organization that has serious pull in those communities. Uh, we very recently fought a by-election in Limpopo, uh, outside on the outskirts of Sesheho, where we picked up 10% in the very first by-election we've ever contested. So I think our, our bona fides in terms of taking support from the ANC is very much on record and on display. You know, certainly as it relates to collecting votes from what you'd call opposition parties, etc. I mean, I don't think it's something we primarily pursue per se. Um, I made a remark earlier that, I mean, it doesn't necessarily help the electoral landscape yeah. uh, by pulling from, from parties you plan to align with. But, you know, certainly to the extent that it's happening, we're not going to be apologetic for it. So we do get a lot of support from you know, supporters of those parties. We don't regard it to be a loss to the coalition because we're a party that's committed yeah, to sure. working in those coalitions. And ultimately, I think there's a very troubling notion that has been suggested by some parties like the DA, where, you know, like, you know, Action SA shouldn't be campaigning in our communities, which is a remarkable statement if you don't believe in a political monopoly, mm. because ultimately there must be competition. Mm. And today it might be Action SA benefiting from that competition. Tomorrow there might be another party that comes on and does a better job and, and they, they gain votes from us. Mm. But that's the kind of system that's going to be required, as we know from you know, a private free market system mm. that you've got to have for the very best performance to take place from political parties. Yeah, I mean, look, there, there is a thing that, that, that it feels to me, uh, the potential danger, I suppose, for let's call them the coalition uh, groupings, is this, this almost desperation to get rid of the ANC is almost sort of seem in some cases blinding everybody from, from doing some of the hard work. You, and understandably so, you, we've got to get rid of them. My Lord, they are really sort of uh, destroying everything they, they touch. So you are well on the way, growing nicely. Uh, come election uh, next year, you represented a nationwide. Uh, you've got leaders in every province. And um, I presume your campaign is going to be as high profile as some of the existing players, you know, um, DA, EFF, and we're going to see Action SA on every, on every lamppost. Is, is that the... Uh, oh, absolutely. I think South Africans have already grown accustomed to the idea that Action SA is regarded to be part of that grouping of the top four parties in the country. Obviously, in 2024, we'll get a, a measurement of what that actually is. Mm. But certainly, I think from all perspectives, you know, the way we're growing, the way structures are coming up, the way we are taking votes from the ANC, uh, and I think the credibility of the leaders that we are putting forward, uh, that kind of collective of dynamics is creating a situation where I think we are seen to operate in that space of the top four countries in the party. And then parties in the country. Michael, you you know, we've, we've obviously, it hasn't, 
one of the hallmarks of South African politics has been a party led by a personality. Sure. And and then, you know, Bantu Alamisa um, Cope tried it. Um, you know, IFP went all the way down the, you know, the snake when they were playing snakes and ladders by staying only with, with Butelezi. Um, obviously, you, you come into this with a strong person at the helm, a strong personality at the helm in Herman Mashaba. Um, how confident are you and, and should the voters be that there's genuine alternatives when, um, you know, uh, let's say in the post-Herman era? Sure. So, I mean, I think let's be clear, in the initial years of a political party, the success of the party is always tied to the success of the individual. Mm. I think that's perfectly normal in the life of a new political startup. The question is how long that will remain the case. If you look at the EFF, I mean, if Julius Malema were to give up and say, I've had enough of this, the yeah. EFF would die with him. So I think from that point of view, you never want to be in that space. We're working very hard to diversify the leadership team in our party. And I think already you can see a lot of the people we're bringing into our organization, the Quena Mangopes, the Athel Trollops, Bongani Beloys, people like that. There's definitely a deepening of the talent in our organization and the number of people who are leaders unto themselves. But I think quite importantly from our point of view, and this is one thing that I think is a positive virtue about working with someone who has succeeded in business before they come into politics, is, is Herman is not an insecure person. Yeah. He doesn't feel like many politicians do, yeah. that I must surround myself by the lowest common denominator sure. so that I look good as a leader. Yeah. Uh, he does surround himself with strong people, and he does you know, accept being challenged in that way. And I think that bodes well for the strength of leadership in our party. Yeah, because you've got to ask the question, uh, what would Bantu Alamisa do if he wasn't leader of the UDM? It's not like he can go back and run his business. You know? Sure. So um, yeah, that that uh, that I get, and and you could you could add to that, and I think that is part of the reason why the ANC have been so keen to not support business because they don't want independent-minded people like Herman Vashaba. The next thing they get ideas that they could do it better. So it's easier just to keep the country in perpetual poverty, or even worse, keep let whites make money but not blacks because the next thing blacks are going to get ideas unless it's tender and they rely on the government. Well, I mean, this is a country where your government actually celebrates having more people on a social grant system than less. I mean, you know, when the numbers go up and it's said during a State of the Nation address with a beaming president so proud yeah. that another million people are dependent on social grants, we should be weeping yes. as a country. We shouldn't celebrate dependence. But as you say, I mean, the ANC, every election turns around to use those very same grants to be the reason that you must vote for us versus those guys because they'll take it away from you. Yeah. Now, Michael, just in uh, as we, we, we head towards the door here, um, you have felt the, the sting of the last kick of the mule, right? And that is in some of the dirty tricks that were played on the coalition, the maneuvering, the the continual, you know, uh, moving to get the coalitions to collapse, especially here in the in the um, metros here in Gauteng. And ultimately, the, you know, that kind of meddling, that kind of um, ba bad practice does sadly work in many cases because eventually one of the partners starts saying the wrong thing the next one gets angry it's quite easy to stir up that uh, little hornet's nest now you know the anc they're not going to go quietly are they how do you see a post 2024 election situation happening so i mean i'll deal with that right away but i hope i'm going to return to the first part of your question because mm. it's an interesting kind of uh kind of proposition but Certainly, I, I do see that the ANC will go. I don't think they will go quietly. But I also don't hold the concern that others have that there would be, you know, insurrection in the country and that the ANC would, you know, be able to defy democracy and stay in power against the will of the people. I think it's also quite important to remember that a big part of that equation is the question of the loyalty of the police and the army. And I think the ANC has done a tremendous job in alienating both because of how they have mismanaged both. If you go into a police station and you engage with the average policeman or woman in this country, they are disillusioned because of how they've been let down politically. They've had their hands tied behind their back. They've had resources deprived of them. They try and do their job and they get fired if they do the right thing because they do it against the wrong person. 
Uh, and I think there's a lot of resentment there. And while the ANC might be able to command the, the very top brass of the people who are politically aligned to them and appointed for those reasons, I don't think they're going to have the support of the rank and file. And I think our court system in South Africa is a very strong system. It's a system that continues to offer South Africans some degree of hope uh, in the face of other failing government institutions. And then you were going to go back to the first part. Well, yeah, I mean, it was an interesting point. I mean, we've seen how the ANC handles dynamics in these coalitions. And I think, ironically, in places like Gauteng, I think they're accepting they're in the opposition space. I mean, they were brought below 35% in the 2021 local government elections in the province. And I think the notion that they will lose Gauteng province in 2024 is almost a certainty. But I think it's an important point to make here is that while the ANC and EFF will employ dirty tricks, and we've seen them a hundred times, what is frustrating is when you have existing coalition partners with whom you have a majority and therefore dirty tricks should not succeed in any way, and yet they engage in you know forms of behavior in coalition, they end up collapsing coalitions because those coalitions weren't collapsed because of the ANC or EFF collectively who did not have a majority. They were collapsed because of decisions within the coalition. And the reason why I circle back to this and why it's so important is if we as a country understand that our future lies in coalition, however you regard the favorability of that thing, the mathematical numbers appear certain in that regard. Yeah. The question has got to be, can I vote for a political party on the idea that they deliver well or they have good policies if in coalition they are unable to implement it for longer than a year? I want, to, I want to close off with one last question that I think must be on people's minds. And that is, in your opinion, you've been involved in coalitions at a local government election, um, local government level, I should say, be it uh, municipalities, be it metros. Um, what, with the added pressure of national government, the stakes are that much higher. Sure. Right. Do you see that being a force for good or a force for bad in coalitions? I think it's going to be a force for good, ultimately. Um, and the reason I say so is twofold. I think, one, let, let's understand coalitions are very new in this country. They're new to the media, to politicians, to you know, voters, etc. And I think there's always that kind of storming and norming phase, if you're using the business terminology, of getting used to a new environmental trend like this. Uh, and there's no question we've gone through a storming kind of phase, and I think we're going to enter a norming phase. But also, I think when 2024 comes around, there's going to be questions about the stability of our country under coalition, recognizing that if a municipality collapses and goes this way or that way, it's problematic. If a national government collapses, the consequences on the economic output of the country, et cetera, you know, that's very concerning. That, that's far, far worse. And I think for that reason, there will be a lot more scrutiny on political parties and ultimately a lot better behavior in coalition because of that scrutiny. Well, let's hope that uh, that is the case. And I'm pretty sure the coalition would, uh, would be in a better position on a national scale. Michael Beaumont, thank you so much for coming in today. Always good to have a chat with you. And uh, thank you so much. And to everybody that's joined us here on the State of the Nation, please... Subscribe to our channel. The more people we get, the more good content we can keep putting out. I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our next edition of the State of the Nation. Michael Beaumont, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.